Hello, everyone. It's about a minute until our time for our class to start tonight. Glad you could be with us. Uh, I'm Dr. Rick Janelle with the uh, Bellevue Church of Christ outside of Omaha. And uh, as soon as it's uh, straight up seven o'clock, we'll get started with our class. Glad you could join us. All right, my clock says that it's uh, time for us to get started. I'm glad you could be with us. Tammy and I have uh, made the move to uh, the, the Omaha area just, just fine. We're enjoying visiting with uh, the Johnstons, and uh, we're in the process of buying a house, selling a house. And as you might imagine, our life is a little, uh, little chaotic right now, but that's all right. Everything will be just fine. Everything will, uh, everything will work out well. I'm looking forward to sharing some thoughts with you tonight about honoring God's Word. Uh, that was my sermon topic last Sunday, and there were some things I didn't get a chance to talk about then, so this is a good chance for me to do that. Our text this evening is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and uh, this was our, our uh, scripture reading as well last Sunday. Uh, Paul says, This then is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries that God has revealed. The point to this is that it doesn't matter whether you're a minister or a Bible class teacher or an elder who's teaching you is your favorite person or your least favorite person. The message that they're teaching, if it truly is from God's word, if it truly is from the Bible, the message is not their message. And uh, your response to it shouldn't be dependent on whether you like them or whether you don't like them. Why? Because we're to view messengers from God as just that. They're messengers. They're not God. They didn't originate the message. Uh, they're saying it doesn't make it true. They're not saying it does not make it a lie. They're saying it doesn't make it a lie. Um, the source of uh, the source of God's word comes from God, and uh, the qualifications for being truth is not who says it or where it's said. The qualification for truth is uh, does it match with what God's word tells us? And to that degree, a, a person is a uh, is a, a faithful minister or a faithful not a faithful messenger or fa or not faithful, and. Uh, We've been entrusted with these these mysteries, Paul says, but we didn't create these mysteries. We didn't think of them. They're not ours to handle as we wish. We've just been given a, a, a job to pass them along. And you know, if you're a Christian, you have that you have that authority as well. We're supposed to share uh, the, the the reason for our faith with all people, for, for the reason for our confidence. Um, and so, verse two, he says, now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. So that's kind of a warning for those of us that try to speak for God. And that warning is, when you're given the job of a messenger, you're going to be tested and judged as a messenger. The, uh, the quality of your work, the, uh, um, the, uh, the, 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 whether it's understandable or not by other people, uh, many, many cases is dependent upon you. If your life doesn't match the message, and that creates a uh, an interference with the message, you'll answer for that. If you don't take the uh, the job of communicating it seriously and just treat it haphazardly, you'll answer for that. Uh, we've been entrusted with something that's greater than us and uh, more powerful than us. And uh, then he says in verse 3, I care very little if I'm judged by you or any other human court. Indeed, I don't even judge myself. He says, my conscience is clear, verse 4. Uh, but that doesn't make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. And boy, aren't you glad that we're not uh, responsible to judge each other. I'm so glad that I'm not going to be ju judged in the courtroom of God by other people, whether they love me or, 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 or hate me. Sometimes my, my uh, best friends have been, uh, been the, the most hurtful people to me, and sometimes my greatest enemies have been the greatest help to me, and it's, all, it's always a mess. And it seems like that... Uh, um, there have been times when I haven't done my best and I've gotten by with that. And there's other times that I have done my best and it still wasn't enough for people. And uh, it's so very good to know that, uh, you know, we're going to answer to God. We're not going to answer to our own conscience and we're not going to answer to each other. We're going to answer to the God who entrusted us with this message. And uh, uh, Paul goes on and he says, uh, therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. 
the warning for all people is that we should not be sit, sitting in judgment on each other. We should not uh, suppose that we understand why people do the things they, they, that they do. It's very simple why people do the things they do. It's because they thought that was best. They might have been wrong, they might have been right, but the why is very simple. People do what they do because they think it's best. Um, and so then the question becomes, well, was it best and was it good? And did they do, did they have extenuating circumstances? And the answer is, there's no way for you and I to know. And so we're not to judge. It's God's job to judge. Uh, he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, Paul says at the end of verse 5, each will receive their praise from the Lord. Listen, I, uh, I used to ha have people tell me sometimes, you know, I can't, I can't just forgive them for being awful to me. They, they treated me too badly. I can't let them off that easy. You don't understand. No, nobody's getting away with anything. The fact that you forgive somebody has more to do with you and your head and your heart than it does with them and their standing with God. You have no authority to, 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 to forgive someone else's sins. That comes through God. That's grace and mercy through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and just because you forgive somebody doesn't mean that they're innocent in the courtroom of God. And the Bible says that every sin will be judged. Every son, sin will be paid for. Nobody's getting away with anything. Uh, that son, Every sin will be punished. The only question is, will it be, will that punishment fall on Jesus or will it fall on you? Will it fall on Jesus or will it fall on them? But nobody's getting away with anything. He will bring light and make hidden what is in the darkness. And, uh, and so verse 6, he goes on First 1 Corinthians 4, he says, My brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos. Those were the two ministers for the church in Corinth. Paul had uh, started there, and Apollos followed him. And some people say, well, I like Paul better. And others say, oh, I like Apollos better. And uh, he says, uh, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that me you may learn from us the meaning of the saying. And here's the saying, do not go beyond what is written. He goes on, he says, then you will not be puffed up as being a follower of one of us over against the other. There's something that happens to God's people when uh, they decide that other Christians need more than just the word of God so that they can keep their lives straight. Um, there's, there's many places in the Bible where God tells us things that are right and are wrong, and yet there are other times when we try to uh, help people out. We say, well, you know, um, the, the, the Bible says you're not supposed to, to forsake the assembly of God's people. And so uh, we back that up and we say, so anytime God's people gather anywhere, you better be there or you're in trouble. And that's not true. That's not what he says. That's not what it means. Um, the, the Bible tells us we're to give as we've been prospered. Somebody else comes along and says, well, you better give as much as I do or you're not going to be in good shape. That's not what it says. Uh, we tend to try and want to add two things sometimes to help other people out, we think. And sometimes we do it to make ourselves look better so that others will know that we are more spiritual or more obedient than they are. And all those things result from a thing that, or result in a thing that Paul calls being puffed up. He tells the Corinthians another place talking about, in this book, talking about spiritual gifts, he says uh, that, that knowledge has a tendency to puff up. And that's why that if you're going to seek after a certain spiritual gift, you should seek after the gift of love and showing love. Because uh, many times knowledge puffs up, and we find that to be true. We find that to be true over and over again. Uh, there's things that cause us to be puffed up, and they're generally things that we tend to be able to, you know, shine our, our, uh, our fingernails on our chest and say, you know, I'm a better person than you. I'm a better person than them. I'm more important to the kingdom. I've been around the kingdom more. And uh, one of the ways we can do that is... Uh, by adding to God's word, and, and 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 Paul says we should be very careful to do that, and to, to not do that. Excuse me. Um, and so my, I make the claim that I believe that truth is balanced, that it's in the middle, uh, that almost always uh, one extreme or another is not truth. It's not God's will. God is a God is a balanced God. He's a God of beauty and a symmetry and order. And and uh, and so another way to say it is that when we when we approach Scripture. We need to bind what the apostles bound, but we need to set loose what the apostles set loose. We need to emphasize what the apostles emphasized and not emphasize what they didn't emphasize. Um, so many times we'll, we'll take parts of scripture that are 
you know, a, a, a little bit thing, for example, where the Bible talks about, uh, I think it was, was it Peter or Jude? I just brought this to mind. I should have looked it up earlier. Was it Peter or Jude that talks about uh, um, Jesus uh, having preached to the spirits that were in prison. And I think the word actually uses Hades there. And it's the only place that's talked about. And I've seen, you know, pages and pages and pages of people writing, trying to explain what that is. And I think I have a pretty good, pretty good understanding what that is. I'm not going to talk about it tonight. But the point is, um, there's lots and lots of other places where uh, the Bible talks about many other things. When they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you're going to specialize in something, special in the greatest command. And if you don't really understand the whole preaching to spirits in prison and Hades and all that other kind of stuff, um, Listen, it, it's, it's not something that's emphasized by the apostles. And so if you don't, you know, it's not like there's going to be a, a test at the pearly gate someplace that you've got to make a passing grade before you get in. It's not that way at all. The Bible says this, it tells us that we're saved, that our salvation comes by grace through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone could boast. So any of these things that we tend to be able to boast about, how smart we are, how knowledgeable we are, how rigid we are in our keeping of God's rules, how rigid we expect you to be in keeping God's rules, all those things that can puff us up, we need to be careful about that. Yes, we do need to bind what the apostles bound, but we also need to loosen what the apostles loosen. And so I told people that Sunday that uh, there's, a, there's a quote from the, uh, or a phrase, a, uh, a slogan from the restoration movement in the United States and it wasn't just in the United States. There were the, the, the same kind of slogan was used for hundreds of, year, hundreds of years before that in Europe. Uh, and here's the one Thomas Campbell said in the uh, Declaration and Address of 1809. He said said that uh, that he believed that Christians uh, should 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 believe or should teach that in matters of faith we should have unity, in matters of opinion we should have liberty, and in all things we should have love. And uh, you, you find other people that. English Puritans, Lutheran Reformers, Anglican Reformers, uh, Catholic Reformers, all through the years have said things that were very similar. And the idea is this, honoring God's word requires both obedience and freedom. And the first one is, the first part of that is we must obey God. We've got to do what God tells us to do. We talked about that pretty pretty in-depth Sunday. Um, we, we, we've got to do what God tells us to do. And yet we need to be careful because even Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, that you can twist the Bible. You can twist the scripture to your own destructions. And uh, his warning in 2 Peter 3.16 is specifically about the writings of Paul. When, when Peter says, uh, Paul writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking of these matters, his letters contain things that are hard to understand. So here's one apostle who had been a longtime friend of Jesus, walked the earth with Jesus, speaking about another writer, another apostle saying, this guy, he writes some deep things. He writes some things that are hard to understand. And it might have been tough for a, for, a, for a marginally educated fisherman to understand some things that a guy like the Apostle Paul, who had stated at the feet of Gamaliel, had the equivalence of a couple of doctorates maybe in today, today's world. Um, maybe Peter did have a hard time understanding them. But the point is, you've got to use the Bible correctly. And we have to obey God's word, but we need to be careful that we're not twisting God's word to say things that it shouldn't say. And so I use the example Sunday that you can take the Bible and make it say anything. Um, Jesus told people, Joe told uh, Judas, uh, no, no, he didn't tell Judas. Judas Jesus said, go, uh, Jesus one time said, go thou and do likewise. Okay. Uh, go, like, go out and do likewise what? Well, you pull another piece of verse from somewhere and it says, Judas went out and hanged himself. Well, I'm supposed to go hang myself? Well, that's what the Bible says. I read it word for word. Well, do I need to be in a hurry about it? Well, Jesus said, what you do, go do it quickly. And those are all three quotes from the Bible, but they're misused. They're twisted. They're cut from here and there, and they're pasted together. And if you do that, you can make the Bible say anything. And it's one of the things that Peter warns about. It says, you can twist the scriptures to your own destruction. We must handle God's word correctly, which is what Paul tells Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, one who handles correctly the word of truth. Um, we've got to obey God's law. We've got to do what God tells us to do. And yet, in many of our churches, at least in the fellowship of the churches of Christ that I've been a part of, 
uh, we don't usually argue too much about the things that God directly says. We tend to have a like mindset, at least in most churches of Christ congregations. We have kind of the idea that, well, if God says it, that settles it. But for many of us, our problem comes in where there's these things that God doesn't say. Um, or he'll tell us in general terms something, but he won't give us specific. And so uh, little things have really tripped up churches through the years, like the Bible tells us that we're supposed to worship on the first day of the week. But it doesn't tell us where, and and, and uh, it does. It, we are given the acts of worship that God expects, but we're not told about the house. Or for just for an example, we are told to sing and make melody in our heart. But then the question that comes up: Okay, so how do we do that decently in order? Is it okay to use songbooks? And in the past, there have been people who said, "No, the Bible doesn't think, say anything about songbooks, so you can't have songbooks." Well, can you have a song leader then? Some people say, "Well, no, you can't have a song leader." Uh, you just have to kind of sing. Well, how are you going to sing together then? Well, I don't know. He says to sing, but he didn't say anything about all that other kind of stuff. Where, Bible, where the Bible is silent, we've got to give people the freedom to do things as they see fit. Because that's the way God does it. Uh, Deuteronomy 4, 2, the people were told, even with the law of Moses, that God says, do not add to what I command you. Do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. So where there's a clear teaching of Scripture, we have to obey. We don't have to like it. We don't have to agree, but we have to obey. But where there's silence, where there's question, where there's disagreement, and no clearly said, thus saith the Lord, we've got to give each other the freedom to see things differently. Um, so let's look at a couple of verses that talk about not adding to God's word. Um, how about 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? We used to have to memorize that one uh, in our Bible classes when I was a, uh, was a boy. The Bible says, all scripture is God breathed. In New Internet, I mean, excuse me, the King James Version says, uh, all scripture is inspired. That's what inspired means is to breathe, God breathe. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God might be thoroughly equipped every good work. Listen, you don't need anything but the Bible. You don't need to say what does brother so-and-so say about that Bible. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what grandma said about the Bible. God's word is all we need. Now we do need God's word. We need to study it. We need to be serious about our study of it. We need to use it well and not, to, not twist it to our own destruction as Peter warned. But we don't need to add things to it. We don't need to add things to it. Um, Second Peter chapter one, Peter also talking about this kind of idea. He says that uh, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about the, by the prophet's own interpretation of things. Listen, if there was ever anybody that had the right to interpret what the Bible meant, it was the guy that wrote it, <laughs> right? We see a new books come out on the, the New York Times list and they interview the authors on TV shows or on talk shows or on talk radio. And so the, the, the interviewer will say, well, you know, I read your book and I read this chapter and here's what it says in that chapter. Can you explain that a little more? Well, why do they ask him Well, or her? Because they wrote it. And if you want to know what the book means, you ask the person that wrote it. And yet here, Peter says, you've got to understand that there's no prophecy of scripture that came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. And if, it's, if it didn't come about it by the prophet's own interpretation of things, and good, if good scripture, if good theology didn't come from uh, the mind of the human that wrote it, trust me, it didn't come either from the mind of the preacher that talked about it, or the member that sat in the pew for 30 or 40 years, or the person that studied Hebrew and Greek the most. Uh, the value of prophecy, the value of scripture, the value of, 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 of the things that we have that are the word of God. Verse 21, he says, for prophecy never had in its origin in human will, but, in, but the prophets, though human, spoke from God as though they were carried along, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So sometimes you'll get into a Bible class or get into a discussion with somebody and, and uh, somebody will say, well, I know what that says, but I know what he really meant. I can I can tell how I can tell Paul how he should have rewritten that for our modern people. No, you can't, because according to Peter, even Paul didn't write what he wanted to the way he wanted to the way he understood it. He wrote as God moved him along. We don't really understand exactly how the mechanics of that worked, but the point is the Bible that you have in your hand is the Word of God. It's not the word of a human. Even though it came through the mouth or the the pen of a human, it was not a human that thought about it. It was not a human that explained it. It was God that sent it and God's Holy Spirit that helped make it plain. 
And so today the same thing is true. And so many times, though, in churches, we'll have two or three people that'll look at a particular verse and they'll each see it a different way. And they'll say, no, no, my way is the right way. And somebody says, no, no, you're wrong. I'm right about this. Peter warns. We must remember that the understanding of Scripture doesn't come from humans. It doesn't, it, it, it didn't come from, the Scriptures didn't come from humans. The true understanding of it doesn't come from humans. And guess what? Humans can be wrong in their understanding of it. If uh, you and I have a disagreement about what a particular passage says, I could be wrong and you could be right. You could be wrong and I could be right. Or we could be, both be out in left field. We could both be wrong someplace and somebody else would have to tell us what to do. The point is, in Scripture... We need to let the scripture speak for itself and we don't need to put ourselves in a position where we say, well, you know, because of my ability, because of my whatever, it's my job to explain this to you. Well, it is my job as God's messenger to do that. But if you and I disagree about scripture and it's not crystal clear and plain, I need to give you the right to be wrong (laughs) and you need to give me the right to be wrong until God or his spirit sets us straight in some way because the true meaning of scripture it was written by god and it comes from god and you and i are not to add to it so that we can make god's word more plain Um, no that's not the way that it works and why is that because this this thing number three uh in in the in the uh in the the slogan from the uh, restoration movement we need to do all things in love we do all things in love Um, and we need to let god define love so we look in 1 Corinthians 13 where God defines love as, as being patient, and being kind, and being forgiving. We bear all things. We believe all things. We hope all things. We trust all things. We endure all things. Um, and we do that for each other, right? Uh, the, the, the point is there's none of us on the planet that can claim to be without sin. There's none of us that can claim to have always been right and to have never been wrong. I sometimes jokingly tell people, um, you know, I thought I was wrong once, but I was wrong. And everybody laughs because anybody that knows me knows I'm wrong a lot. And if I tell myself that I've never been wrong, or the only time I was wrong was when I thought I was wrong, uh, I'm, I'm living in a fantasy world. I'm living in a fantasy world. I have a, a friend in uh, in Pennsylvania. One of his one of the ways that he likes to irritate people is he'll say, "I'm not perfect, but I'm so close." Anybody that knows him will laugh and scoff and say, yeah, right, yeah, right. And I like saying that same thing, too, for the same reason. But we need to remember that, that um, in all things we have to have love. We have to have understanding about people. And so Paul told the Galatians, for example, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, it's for freedom that Christ set us free. Free from what? Free from the law of sin and death. Free from uh, our failures. Free from our past. Free from the guilt for our sins. Why were we set free? For freedom. So he says, stand firm then and don't let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And he's talking specifically about religious people that want you to be in slavery to them, that want you to let them tell you, well, okay, God's word says this, but you got to add this, 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 and this to it, or you can't be part of my club. Well, that might be true about someone's club. It's not true about the church of God. And may God forgive us for the times that we turn our churches into clubhouses and we create uh, bylaws and rules that people have to live up to that are more in addition to the scriptures. Listen, those were the people that Jesus got angry with. Those were the people that he, you know, made a whip and he turned over the tables. And and, uh, those are the people that uh, decided early on, this guy's got to die because if he's right, we're wrong. We don't want to be wrong, they thought. Um, And so what's the point? God sets people free. We've got to set people free too. And uh, if you've ever raised children or grandchildren, you know how hard that is. It's it's, it's kind of easy when your children are babies or toddlers and uh, they're starting to get cranky. Uh, You know, if you take them back and you put them in the, uh, you put them in the baby bed and you make sure the sides of that bed are raised high and, and they're too small to crawl out of that thing. And you can walk down the hall and you can kind of pull the door shut so they can have some quiet and you can say, oh, this is great. I've got them, I've got them pinned in. I can sit down and relax now. What happens when they get a little older and they learn how to climb over those things? They learn how to climb out of that bed and, uh, you know, you come back into the room and now the room's trashed or they've done this, that, the other. They've gotten, they've kind of fallen, gotten hurt because the side was so high. All of a sudden now, the older they get, the more freedom they're able to get for themselves 
the more danger there is for them and they're the more the more worried you get because you love them and you care for them and you want to shelter them from that and yet you know that the whole purpose of raising children is to teach them how to survive in a dangerous world the family of god is the same way and so sometimes we're afraid to give young christians or other christians the, too much freedom because we think but what if they make a mistake what if they hurt themselves what if they do something wrong what if they uh what if they, what if, what if, what if, what if? And we become afraid, and so we want to put them back in the playpen. We want to put them back in the, the, the crib. We want to raise the bars up. And we want to say, no, you got to stay here. you got to stay here. It doesn't work in the physical world. It doesn't work in our physical families. It doesn't work in the, in the church either. It's for freedom that you were set free. Stand firm, he says. Um, and then you find in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32, God says, regarding the law of Moses, see that you do all I command you to do, but do not add to it and don't take away from it. See, honoring God's law means we've got to be obedient, but we can't create new laws that God didn't make. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, we read earlier, don't go beyond what is written. It doesn't help anybody. You may think it's helping people. You may think you're, you may have the best uh, reasons in the world. You may know time after time after again that people who didn't listen to you about this uh, messed up and fell flat on their face. If God didn't say it, we can't make those rules. Our churches can't enforce those rules. Now, we try to, but listen, there can be a time of when, we, when, we, when we have to answer for these things. And so, I say that honoring God's word requires both obedience and freedom. And listen, all of us tend to be extremists. We tend to run hot and cold. Uh, we tend to want things um, our way, whether it's uh, turning loose the things that God bound or binding things that God, we tend to think we know best. And if you would ask any of us, why did you do anything? It's, the answer is always the same. We thought it was best. We thought that was best. But the Bible tells us that God's ways are not our ways. And so when it comes to the, the word of God, when it comes to the rules of God, don't set aside the rules that God makes. When God tells you not to do something, there's a good reason that you shouldn't do it. When God tells you to do something, there are good reasons for you to do it. But it's never right for even well-meaning, strong Christians, even ministers. It's never good to make laws that God didn't make. Why? Because that's not the loving thing to do. The loving thing is to help people, to love them. We may think we're being loving. We may think we're... But imagine what kind of a life a child would have if they never got out of the playpen. If they never got out of the, got out of the baby bed. If they, they never learned how to sit still at the table long enough to eat. I remember one time where uh, my, my parents, when I was younger, they used to do fill-in uh, house parents sitting for a local children's home. And we were there one weekend when they brought in a little girl. Uh, she was seven years old and she didn't know how to walk. And when we found out her story, we found out that found out that her parents were so afraid of the world they brought this child into. They were so afraid of crime and uh, afraid of war and afraid of traffic and afraid of everything. But they had taken this little girl and they had locked her in a closet from the day she was born. And they opened the closet door a couple of times a day to feed her and give her some water. And when the social services people found her, um, her, her clothing hadn't been changed in days. She didn't know how to use a toilet. She couldn't walk. She couldn't crawl. Uh, she couldn't speak. She could just make 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 noises. And yet she was she, she should have been she was old enough she should have been to school. And it was so heartbreaking to see this little girl next to other kids her her same age, and her lack of freedom. Her try and her parents who were mistakenly and, 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 and wrongly trying to protect her from the world. They didn't protect her from anything. They crippled her. And I never heard how the rest of her life turned out, but I bet, I bet she lived with some of those mental and emotional scars for the rest of her life. I bet there were some things that she should have learned to deal with at the age of two and three and four and five, that yes, they were dangerous. And less, yes, they uh, uh, made grandma's hair turn gray a little bit. But what kind of life do you have if you can't deal with those, you know? What, what kind of life do you have if you've got a 16, 17, 18 year old that doesn't learn how to drive? <laughs> and yet you hand them the keys on a Friday night and you just can't, you pace the floor until they come back. Why? Well, they're, they're, they, they might get in a wreck. They may do something stupid. They could be with other people. They could, and you start, your mind starts going, and, then, and, and when they come in late, don't you worry about them? Sure. But should you give them the car keys again? Yes. 
God does the same thing with us. He tells us things for our good that we should stay away from. He tells us things for our good that we should do. But there's a whole wide range of things where God says, this is what I want. Figure it out. You do, you, you do it. You guys figure out how you want to do it. And that's why different churches look different, why different nations look different, why Christians from different backgrounds look different. We have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And yet, there's a lot of things that we don't have one. Some churches worship with song books now. Some churches worship with songs projected on the screen. And I would guess that any church that does one or the other probably has people sitting there wishing they could do what they don't do, what other people do. Um, we need to honor God's word, but we need to honor it in both ways, by being obedient and by giving people freedom. And so that's my thought for you tonight. I'm glad you could join us. We've been at this for about 30 minutes. Um, let's take a little time here and see who, who, who joined us. Tammy's here. Hi, Cheryl. Cheryl and Dave. Uh, who else? Let me see. Um, oh, hey, uh, Gary and Marilyn are watching from their house. Uh, hi, Venus. Is it you or AJ? The rest of the family, I hope, maybe. Uh, John Sue, good to see you. Uh, who else? Oh, uh, Donna. Donna, hope you're back home. Hope you're, uh, you're, 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 uh, you're back from your time of, of uh, quarantine with COVID. Um, Venus says Becky's with her. That's great. That's great. Um, let's see. Well, uh, Wilda's with us. Uh, yeah. Kathy Springer. Hey, Kathy. You know, we're not getting any younger. When you and I first met, I didn't have all this gray. And neither of us had all those grandkids either, did we? Uh, Michael Frank, Mike, good good that you could join with us. Uh, I wish I could see you guys' faces. Glad that you're taking time to, to speak. Uh, hi, Michelle. Thanks for joining us. So uh, the way this works is this. You can hear me. You can see me. Uh, you can actually text back and forth with each other. You can text to me. if, if you don't. But if you don't text in, I don't really know that you're here. And uh, so I'm sitting here in my, uh, what's new to me, my church office. Uh, my little elf Tammy is sitting over uh, on the other side there. But this is just, that's, that's, that's all of us. And uh, so we'll wait just a few minutes. You can, uh, you can, uh, you can talk to whoever you want to talk to. And then we'll, we'll shut this down. And uh, I believe, if I understand correctly, uh, Facebook archives these where if you thought this was helpful, if you thought of somebody else that uh, could be helped by these words, and they should be able to log into our, our church Facebook page and, and find it just like you did. Hey, Tiffany, I see where you logged in with us. Glad you could be with us, too. So thank you for joining us tonight. And God willing, we'll plan to do this again next week. That's uh, 7 o'clock our time, Central, 8 o'clock on the East Coast. And uh, glad you could be with us. Thanks. Bye, everybody. <laughs>